I, uh, I really uh, think that, um, that it, is, uh, it is important and useful. And most importantly, the network of so many uh, um, uh, universities and people from different universities, it's not ending by uh, with the, this uh, project ending now that uh, most probably you already have ideas and discussed that how to continue this important work and how to how to tackle the, the um, uh, next challenges together. So I wish you uh, for today very fruitful uh, sharing the ideas and the results, most important results of the project, but also um, a lot of uh, new ideas to, uh, to uh, further cooperation. So you are always welcome back either in uh, person or, or uh, online to Tallinn University and and uh, you see the uh, our summer is uh, ended but still we have a bit of sunshine so hope you you can enjoy uh, surroundings as well so um, unfortunately I have to go back to my duties administrative duties uh, but I will uh, get a short note later, I guess, about the uh, most important results anyway. So thank you for coming. Thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Katrin Nigos. And um, thank you. And my name is Anastasia Zabrotskaya. I'm Professor of Intercultural Communication at Tallinn University Baltic Film Media and Art School. And now I will give a keynote presentation about the Edora project uh, results. And um, I am very happy to see that really today is so nice weather and uh, the climate is very accessible. So showing that uh, uh, climate can be also accessible to people and friendly towards people. But let's now talk about our project. So first of all, this project um, has many partners, as you see, we have Funko from Sweden, Institute for Advanced Communication Management in Slovenia, uh, Paris Ladron University of Salzburg in Austria, and University of Maribor in Slovenia. And uh, this project is led by Tallinn University. And of course, if to talk about the context why uh, a DORA project is needed, then, well, uh, there is increased need for accessible digital publishing. And we all understood it definitely during COVID-19 pandemic, uh, when it was clear that communication must be easy, must be accessible, must be inclusive. And uh, when we communicate important messages, then we must reach every person, every single individual. And of course, there is European Union legislation on accessibility. But another question is uh, how different countries are able to implement this legislation and what the situation actually is. Because if you look at this area of uh, do we have communication professionals who are able to deal with accessibility, then we will see that there is lack of communication professionals with accessibility skills. And um, as you see now on shared screen and here on bigger screen, then uh, we have a project website. And uh, we are very happy to announce today that under main activities and results, there are already two reports published intellectual output one, intellectual output two. So if you go to this website, click on main activities and results, then you will see that you can already read some reports. And definitely after today's final conference, uh, three more reports will be added. Uh, hopefully we will have uh, nice presentations, fruitful discussion, full of enthusiasm and engagement so that uh, we hope that audience will contribute to this report as well. And now definitely when you were listening about uh, the title of uh, this project and we talk about accessibility, then maybe you ask, what is accessibility? 
And if to define accessibility is when all individuals, regardless of ability, are able to participate in society in an independent way. And this can cover anything from being able to move and orientate oneself in the physical environment to absorbing information and performance services, but it is also about being treated well and having a chance to communicate on your own terms. So accessibility is about the whole of life and the whole person. And when it comes to the digital world, accessibility can be defined as all individuals being able to use information communication technology systems, hardware, software, and tools, perform services, and understand content. And if to talk about accessible content publishing, then definitely what is important that information that we generate, this should be able to be used by people from a population with the wider user needs, characteristics and capability. So we need to remember that we have different members in our society and we have to be inclusive society. Uh, as an example, we all have uh, our parents, so all the adults. We do know that in our societies, we have migrants, refugees, minority groups, and definitely content that we publish must be accessible and understandable by all different groups of people who belong to our society. And when we talk about higher education programs, uh, which were analyzed in the frame of this project, then these are bachelor's, master's, doctoral programs or courses at different European universities. And what was important for us that this focus on communication and they always include different modules which are somehow connected to communication, be it communication leadership, communication management, communication strategy, public relations, digital communication, media marketing, and now we arrived to the very important main objective of this program of this project. And the main objective of the Adora project is to educate university teaching and training staff working in the field of communication on accessible content publishing and on how to provide a more inclusive teaching experience in communication programs. And specific objective uh, is to analyze the current situation and bridge the gap with regard to accessibility training needs of teaching and training staff, as well as issues faced by underrepresented groups when accessing digital communication content. And the output is already available. I have already mentioned that we have a website and the results you can read gap analysis. And specific objective two is to identify high education courses and programs related to the field of communication where there is an opportunity for accessibility to be included in the curricula. And output is uh, intellectual output two, mapping of high education programs. And specific objective three, improve the accessibility knowledge of university teachers and trainers in the field of communication and output number three is accessibility training toolkit. And I'm happy to confirm today that it is also coming and will be published uh, on it our. Is, it is online. Uh, it is online. Okay. And uh, specific objective four facilitate access to the labor market on, for students of higher education programs in the field of communication. And uh, intellectual output four set of personas representing professional profiles in the field of accessible communication also coming very soon. And definitely here, I would stress that if we have among listeners, young people who still have question, what should I do as communication manager, please read because then you will understand how important uh, this speciality of communication manager is and how many different opportunities it gives you and actually how important it is to be a professional who knows what accessible communication is. 
And last not least, specific objective five, stimulate the uptake of accessibility in the high education communication curricula in European universities. And intellectual output five, recommendations on the inclusion of accessibility in higher education programs. And again, it will be a report that is uploaded on our website. And here I will stop with the keynote presentation. Now, just to explain to people on Zoom, I will stop sharing screen because I need to change uh, the slides. And um, now it will take a little bit of time. Okay. Um, and again, just to explain to those who are on Zoom that uh, I'm here opening the next presentation. And okay, now I will be sharing the screen. And I hope that now everyone sees on their screens the next presentation and yeah. Yes. yes, great. And before we proceed with these presentations, again, just to explain to everyone that we will have now five presentations in a row. And uh, this will be each presentation devoted to one intellectual output, uh, which was um, like the result of every specific objective that I have just introduced. So now I will be talking about gap analysis on accessibility training. The questions, we talk about the questions. Ah, yes, sorry. And um, yeah, I, well, I'm also nervous, you know, <laughs> I forgot to mention that the uh, questions and answer session is planned uh, after we have the presentations, then we will have a break to rest a little bit uh, from listening. Then we will have panel discussion and question and answer session are planned for, if to talk about Central European time from 5.15 to 5.45, then we will answer all your questions. And in Estonian time, that will be from 6.15 to 6.45. And um, if I see correctly, then on, on chat, we are able to see inserted questions, but hopefully you are curious enough to stay here till the questions and answer session, and then to have an interaction with us. Maybe, for example, you want to have additional question when you will hear our answer. Uh, and now I'm coming back to my presentation. A gap analysis on accessibility training needs uh, for university teaching and training staff in fields related to communication. And the specific objective was to analyze the current situation and bridge the gap with regards to accessibility training needs of teaching and training staff, and to find out issues faced by underrepresented groups when accessing digital communication content. And uh, what is important that this result will focus uh, or actually focuses on two main perspectives. One is accessibility uh, training needs of university teaching and training staff in fields related to communication, what the actual analysis has shown. And the aim was to identify those areas where the staff require training in accessibility. And it aims to identify the respondents level of knowledge in accessibility in different areas, such as legislation, the creation of accessible content, understanding the use of assistive technologies. And it also addresses the extent to which the teaching and training staff takes accessibility into account in the current curricula. And uh, another part of this uh, intellectual output is dedicated to identification of the issues faced by underrepresented groups, such as people with disabilities, all the adults and immigrants when it comes to accessing digital content. 
And it also aims to understand the type of online that causes the most problems in terms of accessibility for these user groups and identify the specific needs that should be taken into account when creating and publishing online content. Both of these tasks are done through the use of surveys and where necessary, also interviews from target groups were conducted. And the result focuses on two main perspectives, analysis of the accessibility training needs of university teaching and training staff in fields related to communication, and uh, also the respondents' level of knowledge. And target audience are uh, uh, higher education, uh, uh, teaching and training staff in fields related to communication and students. And who are the underrepresented groups? These were people with disabilities, older adults, and immigrants. And if to talk about accessibility training needs analysis, then what is important? It uh, was really important to identify really train, real training needs for university staff. And uh, here we can say that university students' interest in accessibility and their requirements for more inclusive learning environments were really uh, something what was uh, found out was really important topic that was found out during the survey. And uh, the interest was high and uh, students uh, showed uh, that they have not only interest, but they have some specific issues that they want to be due to if you talk about inclusive learning environment. And if to talk about challenges of end user groups, like people with disabilities, older adults, immigrants, then uh, the results of uh, this analysis were very important for the development of the accessibility training toolkit that was produced at the next stage of this project. And uh, students who participated in this study were from European universities with major in communication fields like social media, public relations, marketing. And the results showed that the students have a considerable interest in learning about accessibility. But on the other hand, it was quite interesting that students were not really sure about learning support services at the universities that do exist. And at the same time, students stated that they know quite a lot about accessibility. So our educated guess here is that due to a misunderstanding as to what accessibility means, students believed that they know quite a lot about accessibility. And definitely we understood that this would have to be one of the first things to clear up in any training material that is provided. It seems that students sometimes just don't understand the real importance of accessibility. And um, it's really important and instructive to include an aspect in the training toolkit on what accessibility is and whom it does affect to show understanding and the importance of the issue. And regarding the staff survey, the results showed a more modest level of knowledge about accessibility than among the students, or maybe staff uh, has a little bit lower self-perception and less expectations that they know everything. Young people always believe in more positive picture of selves and believe that they know everything about everything. And uh, staff also highlighted a distinct lack of uh, training on accessibility and the need for real experience. So they said that the necessity for hands-on experience in this area is really something they are looking for. Staff believed uh, that uh, all types of training resources would be helpful and they emphasized the, the absence of accessibility training and the necessity for it. They are willing to spend between four, eight hours on training in this subject. And uh, accessibility content creation, practical examples of assistive technology use, usage and the impact of accessible content intrigued the staff the most. 
And uh, there are also notable differences between how the student disability support offices operate in each of the countries and each in, of the university and what kind of support they provide. So we can say that the different models should be investigated and shown. Uh, the staff express the willingness to utilize any training materials and resources developed on this subject. And um, they are quite receptive to blended learning, incorporating both online and offline study methods. There was a general lack of awareness around the issue of accessibility among staff. So they say that usually they tend to consider accessibility only if they know that one of the students has a disability. But uh, sometimes it's not really the case that professors do know that they will have students who will have certain disability and who will attend their course. And the student survey showed an interest in learning about accessibility issues in their university courses highlighting the need for the creation of learning resources on this issue as part of the project. And this notion is further supported by the distinct lack of training and experience on accessibility among the teaching staff who responded to the staff survey. And we can say that finally, the need for training on the subject for both university staff and subsequently students can be seen by the large amount of accessibility issues that are faced by end users, both on websites, apps, and when using documents such as Word, PDF, and PowerPoint. Thank you so much for your attention. And now what I will do, uh, again, I am just explaining what I do, that I'm finishing this presentation. And uh, I will be now changing, stop sharing, first of all, and I will be opening the next presentation. And um, next presentation. <clears throat> Intellectual output two. And uh, uh, I will be sharing the screen. Yes. And uh, yes, and let me check. It looks like I think that maybe we now need to change. Switch. Yeah, to switch. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me come here. And the speaker now will introduce herself. And okay, uh, so hello, everybody online and everybody on site. I look here. Yeah. My name is Maya Pushnik. I come from University of Maribor, Slovenia. And together with my colleagues, Dr. Boštjan Šumak and Dr. Katja Kaus, we're responsible for intellectual output too, with this long title, Mapping of Higher Education Communication Programs where accessibility training can be included. And I will show you a little bit how we approach this challenge what the results were and summarize with uh and findings okay um okay so i will um overview the process of collecting data among all the partner countries uh how we contacted professors assistants or people that are responsible for providing courses in the field of communication, what results were gathered. I will show you some figures, um, what we realized after conducting all the desktop research and surveys and how we mapped the data uh, in the end. Okay, so the process of collecting data consistent, consisted of two phases. Uh, we, all the partners, chose uh, courses, programs that were eligible or appropriate for this research and tried to do as much as possible manually, so to gather as much information that was available online to us. And then we approached 
the professor's assistants uh, who actually are responsible for the, those courses tell us a little bit more about uh, their uh, courses. Is digital accessibility actually addressed? Do they know uh, anything about it? And so, uh, so on. And that the second phase was done in form of a survey slash interview. Uh, this picture here shown on this slide shows what everything was interesting to us. So we wanted to know the country, obviously, the university, the study program, and all the courses within this study program. We uh, took everything that was available to us and we prepared this special information collection te template so all partners could gather data in the same way so we could compare the data in the end and those two tables shown to you shown to you include all possible data like city country site is there any description what does this uh, summary of course say uh, we really wanted to focus if um, digital accessibility is at all mentioned is it like in the trailer or is it something that's maybe um, in the second phase of uh, the course that professor uh, professors uh, have uh, and the results of all partners joint effort came to um, including 32 study programs in all partner countries plus uh, three more. Uh, and within those 32 study programs, we included 225 uh, courses in our research. You can see the numbers in the table. Um, Obviously, Estonia, Slovenia, and Austria have most of the courses because those were the uh, partners uh, in the project, but also Belgium, Denmark, and Poland were included through our contacts. Uh, so first, the study programs, 32 of them are shown here in form of a cloud uh, because there are so many of them, uh, it's pointless to uh, read them all. Um, just to uh, give you insight, most of them were somehow connected to communication, uh, to uh, technology, uh, to uh, economics, marketing, management, and so on. So various study programs were included in our research, and you can read specifically which ones in the um, output document that's available on you online. And here's a mix of uh, the courses, 20, 225 courses with one common word that's communication. There's some, they were somehow connected to this communication, also um, marketing management, um, some even uh, more technical oriented courses and so on. Um, Okay, and the distribution, since all partners were uh, involved in this research, first in desktop, then in survey, uh, the first picture here shows the number of study programs per country. The study programs uh, were, uh, the most of them came from Slovenia, then Estonia and Austria. Uh, however, the courses per country, because um, Anastasia has most connections in Estonia connected to communication courses. Uh, the real winner is Estonia. So 110 courses were actually, yeah, but you know, Slovenia is yeah. serious. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Can I just uh, say here, like uh, a small country wants to be big on the map. Yeah, Slovenia is slightly bigger country. Is it? Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it's slightly bigger on the map. Everything is very logical. Yeah. So we were most invested, right? Also Austria, the the third biggest country. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you see here the distribution of uh, the courses and um, study programs. Okay. And here are the main identified fields. Uh, this uh, numbers here are taken from uh, the standard international classification for education because we really wanted uh, everyone to have this same concept uh, so uh, results will be comparable and the winners here are like um, 
what we got most are arts and humanities actually. So there we gathered our uh, data, social sciences, journalism and information, business administration and law, information and communication technologies. I think Slovenia is mostly responsible for this one. And uh, the subfields here are marketing, advertising, economics, political sciences and civics, sociology and cultural studies, studies, journalism and reporting, communication program, management, administration, communication management and law. So just to um, have a sense which fields were most representative within our obviously limited study. Uh, in the following slides, I will show you some pictures uh, that uh, present the results. So what did we um, realize uh, and hide actually the questions that were given to uh, the professors and assistants of uh, specific courses. We were interested in various things, trying to um, get as much information as possible, how those courses are um, structured and are they comparable among countries so we can map them in the end. So first picture here, figure here uh, is asking about the learning approach. Is it very much theoretical? Is it more practical or is there a balance? And most of the uh, courses had this balanced mixture of practical and theoretical knowledge. So they were very balanced. Equal number 70 had were very theoretical and 70 were very practically oriented. Then the second figure here is um, asking professors, uh, is a digital accessibility actually included in their courses? And most of them sadly said that digital accessibility is not even mentioned. Only a few uh, said yes, DA is mentioned and some courses uh, had actually addressed this subject, but not exactly under this name. They had other synonyms, for example. Um, although the courses that we took were advertised as under communication as, and as courses that would potentially add this digital accessibility topic, uh, or they should anyway. Uh, so most of them did not mention it. Uh, then the next figures um, was very much direct. Do you, uh, does the course already include uh, topics related to the digital uh, accessibility under any name? Um, maybe not the A, but other names. Most of them uh, didn't even know. They said, I'm not sure. Uh, this is not visible here, but many professors ask us, can you give us more information about what is digital accessibility? So um, some said yes, 21 of them, and many said no, like they know for sure that the A is not included. The next question, but do you think that there is a need to include topics such as digital accessibility in the course? Most of them, 70 uh, said yes, uh, that they are um, aware of the importance of this topic more and more. Uh, next figure here, do you have uh, appropriate knowledge uh, to uh, teach topics related to digital accessibility? Uh, most of them said yes, only a few of them uh, said like few of them said actually no, 47 of them, but 68 of them said yes. Uh, they think they do have appropriate uh, knowledge. Uh, and the last figure here, would you be interested in the DORA project activities, extend your knowledge in this topic? Most of us uh, said like, yes, they would be very much interested uh, to extend their knowledge in this uh, topic. But some said, yeah, no. That those are the results. Okay, in the end, we try to gather all the data, um, see if there are some geographical um, differences. Obviously, there's this limitation. This isn't the entire European uh, ground. It, there are only a few partner countries. Um, and Estonia, as said before, had the most courses in the research. Uh, there were there were differences. Sure, uh, some of the countries were uh, more theoretical, or let's rephrase that: some of the 
courses that were included in this research were more theoretically uh, focused, some of them more practical. Um, and here we found the most differences, but like this one common nom nominator here is that uh, in the last, maybe the most important uh, part here is digital accessibility mentioned. No, it is not mentioned. In most courses that were included in our research resulted in the fact that this is not uh, something that is yet uh, included enough in communication programs and something that should be changed. To conclude, uh, included communication programs mostly do not include digital accessibility. Uh, some advertise it as uh, there was a reason that we invited those professors and uh, cho chose specifically those courses. Uh, this, they do kind of point out that this is something that is uh, included in the course, but then after investigating a bit further, we realized nothing is addressed about it. Or in some cases, they use other terminology. This is also a possibility. And as I said before, there are ge uh, geographical differences between us regarding the approach to teaching. However, this problem is quite universal. Yeah, we need it. There's a lack of that very uh, supporting to uh, intellectual output one that Anastasia presented. Um, all identified courses, we believe, have great potential to include digital accessibility in the future. Plus, the professors of those courses also acknowledged that they would be interested in learning more about it, and they would be interested in including more about it if, of course, they would have uh, provided some material, you know, some help, um, as is uh, addressed in this um, project. Okay, thank you. That is all for me. Thank you so much. And uh, again, I will be explaining what I do. And um, uh, I'm just trying to unshare the screen and to open the next presentation. And now I'm trying to share the screen again with the next presentation. And it is here. And the presenter is coming. Yeah. So hello, everyone. Um, it's nice to be back in, in Tallinn beautiful city, uh, and I'm also happy that we have people online uh, watching this conference. So my name is Susanna Lorin. I am the Chief Re Research and Innovation Officer at a accessibility consultancy in, based in Sweden called Funka, and we are really happy to be part of this project. And I will present to you the training material or the training toolkit, as it's called in this project, uh, and a little bit about that. Um, and magically moves. Okay, good. So uh, in this part of the project, we um, base the co-creation process on what has been learned from the previous version. So the whole project was like a waterfall um, process. And we, we knew by then that we, oh, that we had some knowledge gaps to say the least, <laughs> in university courses, and also that we needed to, to target both the, the teachers and training staff, but also of course, uh, and in a second way, um, the the students but we know also that there is a, a big demand for this this uh, knowledge out there not least because of the legislation but we'll come back to that later in the in the panel discussions um so uh, in the in the consortium we uh, worked together to make sure that we had a good material on training and then we we piloted it with with students and teachers in the in the universities in, in the consortium and uh, the content was based on, on open sources, so this is nothing, uh, we didn't invent new things, but we put it together in a way that we think uh, it will be most useful for, for these target audiences. So it's really based on um, the experience from Funka and other partners in the, in the project who work with accessibility, and also the end user research that we have done over the years. Uh, we have also made sure that it is uh, in line with the International Association of Accessibility Professionals body of knowledge. They do professional certification, so we shouldn't do anything that is not provided by the industry. 
And of course, it's also aligned and based on the European and global standards for uh, for digital accessibility and the best practices in, in the industry uh, at large. And um, why cannot I'll do this. Oh, oh now it did. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and we we divided the the course material in two batches or two modules, um, where we wanted to uh, to train about how you create accessible content uh, for all these different um, potential professional groups of uh, professionals in communication, and also how to provide an inclusive teaching and training environment because these are kind of two two parts of the same two sides of the same coin. Um, so we started with doing two, two training courses and then after piloting it and discussing it internally, we realized that, that it will be much more flexible if we divide it into smaller modules. So, so after, after that, we made it into 12 shorter batches or, or parts that can then be uh, used in different ways because it's a difference if the if the students already know about accessibility, then you may jump in on a special topic or if you have there's a little bit different in the prerequisites and, and the needs in the context if you are studying journalism or, or for to be a, a web author. So uh, the 12 different parts that we have published now is um, what is accessibility? So what is what is the topic about? And then we have one part that is about user needs. Um, one piece that is about policy and legislation. Uh, one covers the accessibility standards. No, I shouldn't say cover, but it's an overview of the standards. Uh, and then we have one that is kind of a recap of what accessibility basis is. So basics is so that you can get a kind of a, a, a quick overview of web accessibility basics, and then how accessibility uh, correlates with with communication as a topic. And then we have the second batch that we divided in, in six smaller pieces, which is um, uh, kind of a recap of the first one, what accessible communication is about. And then to put the requirements in practice, um, the eighth one, and it is the biggest part of this, because this is where we go through all the, the requirements of the standard that is deemed relevant for communication officers uh, and, and show examples of what to do and what not to do. And then we have one section talking about inclusive communication, so more disability etiquette and then how to make sure that you are representative uh, in your communication and so on. And we talk a little bit about communication strategies. You can see we're kind of high and low and back and forth a little bit. Um, and then we, we have one piece on accessible content and then a short chapter on accessible events. So we have really tried to cover this broad spectrum of all the different subtopics that you may, may need uh, when you study uh, communication. And just to explain a little bit how we worked with these. So this is an example about um, how to resize text. So uh, there is a success criterion in the um, uh, web accessibility guidelines. Uh, called 1.4.4, if anyone is nerdy interested in that. So it says essentially that text should be able to be resized without using any assistive technology. So just any user with any device should be able to resize text up to 200% without losing any content or functionality. So that's kind of an easy, easy enough non-technical requirement. But what does it really mean? I mean, how do you how do you put this in practice? And this is how we how we have done this. Um, we discussed how the students that piloted this and also the students uh, from the universities in the consortium, how they usually react when they talk about accessibility. So what is the problem here really? Who is the problem for? And then what is the solution? You need to give me really, this is the bad way and this is the right way. So we tried to make this really, really clear uh, to everyone so that it would be easy to follow. And this is one example. So this is my first image that is not decorative. So this is an image of how it can look if somebody is uh, not following this requirement and it's not possible to resize the text without um, losing content or functionality. So in this photo, there is first a, an image of how the text look with, uh, in 100%. And then if you magnify it to 200%, it completely falls out of its design um, and is hard to read. Then we describe what that is. So we have a, an image of it so that we have a real example. And then describe that when the user resizes the text, there is a loss of content and functionality. So we have also an explanation to this uh, image. 
And then we show the, the do part. So the, the, the solution here, this is how it should look when you, the visual is showing the 100% again, it's the same. And then when this is created in the right way, so the 200% magnification is still um, presented in a way that it's readable and the functionality is the same. And then we have the explanation that the user is able to resize the text without assistive technology up to 200%, and there is no loss of content or functionality. And then we have links so that the teacher or trainer can read more or even the students can read more. So we have a little bit of instructions also in this uh, material. So it's like a slide with comments so that everything that is not explained in the, in the slide is then in the kind of the comment part of, of the slides and also links to the standard. So that is the uh, setup of the training uh, modules. And these are, of course, free for everyone to use. Uh, so you're welcome to, to use them in whatever uh, concept. They are published under CC license. And we are really happy to, to um, collaborate with anyone if you want to scale up or, or translate or use this in another, in another concept. And uh, the, um, the training material as accessible PDFs can be found under www.funka.com slash en slash adore hyphen toolkit. So in the pro uh, we can put that also in the chat, I hope, so that you can find um, this material online. And if you would like to know more, it's also my, my email address, but I'm sure you can also find Anastasia uh, online. Yeah, and actually now I'm putting on chat the links and I already see feedback, wonderful. Thank you for sharing these tools. So it's so great to live in digitalized world. So when you can communicate directly, thank you so much. <laughs> And um, again, I will need to deal with some technical issues. And um, so let me now stop sharing this presentation and let me now close it. I have to explain that my background is uh, linguistics. That's why I'm always afraid of when I have to deal with computers, <laughs> which I'm not used to. <laughs> use and um okay let's hope that now i will share the screen correctly yes that's great and please please come yes. here yes okay hello to everyone here and online uh my name is daria ivanusa kline I'm coming from Slovenia, from small uh, non-governmental organization uh, that are that is focusing on uh, accessibility, inclusion, and dig digitalization. So my presentation will be about uh, development of set of personas representing professional profiles in the field of accessible communication. So first, I want to explain you what are personas. Personas uh, is some kind of methodology. It's some kind of tool that is usually used in uh, development of different products. But we decided to use this methodology here to showcase the need for uh, accessibility knowledge uh, among prof for uh, students of communication uh, in the communication fields. So personas are some kind of fictional characters representing key audience segments uh, and are developed uh, on the base of real uh, data facts obtained to real life interviews and other forms of user research. Uh, why we decided for include uh, this methodology, this tool of personas, I already uh, explained. We wanted to establish some kind of link, link between the training on accessible communication and also the existing demand on the job market for this kind of knowledge and this kind of uh, professionals who now, uh, who now how to prepare uh, accessible content. So how, the, how we have developed these personas? Uh, here you can find some information about the methodology uh, we followed to develop personas. First, we try to identify different communication job ro roles or occupations because uh, 
we didn't know where to start. We tried to find which, communi which occupations, communication occupations are really relevant for us, which they, which, in which occupations, professionals, they need to know uh, something about uh, creating accessible digital content. So uh, we started with desk desktop research and then we tried, uh, we, we did a lot of uh, data analysis uh, with uh, which we selected the most relevant job roles for accessible communication. Uh, I will explain you a little bit later about the, our selection, but uh, we didn't try to select all imp all uh, uh, all jobs or occupation that are available in the market that they need. Uh, the knowledge about uh, accessibility, but we wanted to focus on the most relevant ones, the one that are uh, the most of the students will work in these occupations and they really, and in this position, students or prof future professionals, communication <coughs> professionals will really need this, uh, the, uh, the knowledge of access uh, of digital accessibility. So in the next step, we did a lot of interviews with real people working in the selected job roles. And on the end, we uh, developed six personas based on all uh, collected informations. So what are the results of this output? So we selected uh, 25 most relevant occupations uh, from uh, it happens that we realize that the most of these occupations are in the field of marketing, public relations, and journalism. Uh, seven of the, those of these occupations are at managerial level and 18 from professional levels. And uh, on the end, we developed six personas. Uh, and uh, personas are described like some stories about the people who are working in some occupation. Uh, and we provided the information on uh, their age, education, employment or job title, industry, career background, job profile, digital accessibility role, alternative names for the same job role and also recommended accessibility training. This, the last one, this, the last one is connected to our training we have developed it in, uh, uh, in our project. So we wanted to make uh, uh, clear what kind of uh, what kind of training uh, somebody who wants to work on this position would at least would be the minimum to uh, to would need to take to get the minimum knowledge that is needed on this uh, such kind of occupation. So let's uh, look now at uh, personas. We have developed uh, six personas. Uh, we gave them names to be more that that it could be more real uh, that would that they, they would be uh, seen as real uh, real person. So we have developed Anna, public relations office officer, Mary, digital news editor, Monica, marketing manager, Oliver, marketing specialist, Tina, social media manager, and Peter, journalist. So here I will present you some uh, quick information about these personas, but uh, it's short presentation. You would I would advise you to uh, check uh, our website. I think that we will send also the links uh, the links when we will put all the uh, outputs to the when we will uh, upload all the outputs to the website. Uh, I think it's a very interesting output. So Anna, Anna is a public relations officer. She, she's uh, 47 years old, holds a bachelor degree in journalism, but works in government uh, communication uh, communications office. What is important, all government in European Union, uh, all public uh, all public institution in Europe, they need to uh, provide accessible websites. This is requirement from uh, 2018, and uh, this is not something that is uh, they could do or not. They need to do it. So even uh, Anna had uh, Anna Anna is responsible in this organization uh, for preparing and publishing various news items in multiple formats for the official government website. These are news about what the government is working. 
uh, is doing right now and things like that. And she needs to, to take care of the everything that this uh, news will be uh, will be in the right format to be accessible by everyone. Uh, what is important? Uh, what we uh, found out uh, when we did these interviews that all the personas, even the all of the real persons, not only the personas that we did interviews with them they didn't have any they didn't get any um, any knowledge about digital accessibility in their formal education so everyone learned dig about digital accessibility uh, by themselves or with the help from some expert or with some short online courses and uh, even one of the one uh, interviewee uh, also learned something about accessibility from their relatives because he had some uh, some uh, relative that was the person with disability, uh, but none of them really got any knowledge in formal education, and we want to change that in our project. So the second persona is Ma Mari. She's digital news editor. She works at public public TV for their accessible online news portal. Uh, Mary is responsible for selecting, adapting, and publishing news from regular TV programs on the accessible web portal that uh, provides articles with, with uh, different uh, accessibility um, accessibility in different accessible formats, for example, in easy reading format, uh, some uh, with uh, news with audio, audio description, uh, with sub subtitles, and even in uh, news with sign language. Uh, while public service television is not legally required to ensure digital accessibility, this uh, television, it sees uh, accessibility as uh, their priority, as uh, the mission of public service television is to provide news for all, for everyone. So this is part of their 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 miss, mission actually. So they they uh, take a lot of care about uh, this uh, that all the news are also accessible to different kind of uh, popula population. So the next one is Monica. Monica is typical marketing manager. Uh, she holds the, the uh, master's degree in communication. She works as marketing manager at larger municipality. Municipality is also public institution, so it's also required to assure digital accessibility of their uh, websites. Uh, Monica is actually not as a manager. She's not directly uh, involved in creating content but she oversees uh, creating the content for the websites and for social uh, media. So she needs also, she need to have also the knowledge of digital accessibility because she collab collaborates with external de developers, accessibility experts and other external contractors. And she needs to know uh, what she needs to uh, require from other, uh, for other um, other providers uh, to be uh, to be on the safe side to provide really accessible content on the end, on the end. Uh, Oliver Oliver is marketing specialist. Uh, he has a bachelor degree in business and worked for Mayor Bank. Bank is private institution, so it's not formally. Uh, it's not they are not. Uh, they don't do not need to provide accessible accessible content, but they want to provide accessible content because uh, accessibility means also uh, improves their um, their reach. Because if their uh, information about the products or the banks are not uh, accessible on the website, they they limit their uh, target target group only to the to those people who can access the information so they are aware of this opportunity and they want to reach all uh, all target groups so uh, at this bank they also put a lot of uh, effort to to uh, 
to uh, a lot of effort to pro to to provide uh, all the content in accessible way. So it's uh, it's his uh, Oliver responsibility is uh, to provide different. Uh, different news, different articles, different information about uh, for consumers on their websites, and uh, this all the contents needs to be also uh, accessible. Tina, Tina is typical typical social media manager. He is uh, she is a freelancer and works for different clients, and uh, she is responsible for preparation of social media strategy action plans for clients and also for creation of various content uh, tailored to the different social media. Uh, some of the Tina's clients are aware of, uh, of uh, accessibility issue, but some, some of them are not. But she was forced to learn uh, how to provide accessible content. So now she tried to provide accessible content for all uh, cl her clients. But some of them are more aware and they they demand this from her, but some of them are not aware of the issues connected to, to non-accessibility. Non uh, and the last one is Pat, Peter, is, he is a journalist. He works at a news agency and he's some kind of head of media content. Uh, he's responsible for new content formats that the agency is developing for digital channels to make media content more accessible. Uh, and one of the important target group is also uh, are also people with disabilities. So he's involved in development of this uh, new content formats and also in production of news in this new content for formats. For example, he needs to provide uh, news in easy to read format and uh, different kind of uh, other formats that are used for digital news channels and uh, similar. Uh, and he needs to, he is responsible for uh, to take care of everything that the, the, the news are accessible. These are our personas. Thank you for listening to me. I hope that uh, personas uh, uh, did inspire you a little bit that this is not, that we are not talking about something that is not relevant to us, but that this is the knowledge that everyone almost I think that everyone that is working in the field of communication needs to have. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we proceed with the PIPS presentation. And let me now stop sharing the screen first. And let me now open, oh my God, yeah. Uh, Oh, yes. Here. So on your screens, you see now Intellectual Output 5 presentation. Yes, please. Switch. All right, thank you, Anastasia. Good afternoon. Uh, People in the audience and online. Uh, my name is Sergio Sparviero. I'm a, uh, an associate professor at the University of Salzburg in the Faculty of Communications. Um, and this intellectual intellectual output and uh, part of the presentation was also uh, the work of uh, two postdoctoral uh, researchers, uh, Simone Schondoffer and Ricardo Paria. Uh, they worked on the project um, in the last um, few months, uh, since the beginning. Um, so the specific uh, objectives of the intellectual output were already mentioned in the uh, in the, in the input output, uh, sorry, in the initial presentation about the project in general. Um, but I like here to uh, break it down more specifically um, um, what the report is trying to do. Um, obviously, um, we want to raise awareness among lecturers in communication about accessibility, 
uh, the gap analysis that showed that very few people uh, know what accessibility is about. Uh, and when they thought they did, uh, uh, or already they, they know it through different uh, names. So we have to um, somehow uh, put, trying to bring everyone to the, um, to the same point. Uh, and then um, raise awareness also to encourage lecturers to incorporate the topic of accessibility into the lectures. Uh, so first we start with the lectures and then um, they uh, share the knowledge uh, in the lectures uh, with the students. Um, we also do not want to only have accessibility as a topic in some lectures, but also make it this um, some of our skill set um, that coordinators are uh, will consider um, uh, including in actually programs. So giving a bigger space than just mention it um, in, in some lectures. Um, and we do this um, with uh, the concept of itinerary that I'm gonna explain later. Uh, and also we wanna share information about the relevance of training modules uh, that we uh, developed in this project and that uh, as Susanna has just uh, introduced in the presentation of the intellectual output number three. Oh, what happened? Maybe you could uh, maybe try this mouse. Okay, yeah. It looks like our computer wants copy break. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, hopefully it's not. It's the only one. Yeah. Uh, at least for the seven minutes. Yeah. So. Um, so a, uh, a key element uh, that we use to connect uh, the different elements of this project. Uh, so the training, the personas, uh, and the gap analysis, uh, the identification as well of the programs was to uh, do a mapping of fields uh, in media communications research and to connect the topic of accessibility uh, to those fields. Uh, those fields are a uh, topic in a way. I mean, there are sub subfields of media communication research, but are also topic uh, that are taught uh, in lectures, uh, or there are specializations uh, of uh, professors, uh, researchers, uh, and they are also uh, some of specializations in uh, taught programs. Uh, so here, uh, probably many of you would be uh, students of a Master of Intercultural Communication. Uh, my own program has, for example, three tracks as a digital communication leadership. And we have three tracks and one is technology, media and business. Uh, another one is communication policies and regulation and the third one has to do with the information communication technologies for development. So I'm very much to do, uh, uh, very much focus on digital divide and inequalities. Uh, so there's a major topic um, that are uh, relevant to the study and the teaching of media and communications uh, research. Um, so we identified 11 uh, of these fields. Um, so media ethics, uh, intercultural communications, technology and media, uh, digital divide and inequalities, uh, communication policies and regulation, journalism, media audiences, media literacy, marketing and public relations, um, corporate social responsibility, and uh, crisis uh, communications. Yes. Very sensitive. Yeah. Um, how do we come up uh, with this mapping? Uh, of course, uh, our own experience, our knowledge, um, but then uh, in a scientific matter, manner, uh, we have done literature review. Um, and so uh, through this literature review, uh, we have provided the definitions, um, provided an explanations of how accessibility as a topic is connected to each of these fields. But most importantly, uh, we ask experts uh, for that information. And then when we wrote it, try to synthesize it as well, um, we have uh, asked again this expert to review the input uh, that they provided and the way in which we encoded 
uh, into information. Um, and so, and this is how we come up with uh, the connections between accessibility uh, and the field as we have defined it uh, in this project. Uh, these experts um, are all academics um, between the rank of postdocs and professors. And they all come from eight universities from eight different countries. Okay, this is Austria, Estonia, Finland, Germany, Ireland, Netherlands, uh, Slovenia, and Spain. Um, so obviously, um, the report. Um, includes the draft version of the report, uh, includes uh, all these fields and the connection to accessibility for all these fields, but I, I'm just gonna give you two examples. Um, this I think is journalism. Um, and journalists normally will have uh, two types of definitions. So the norm there's a normative definitions, what journalists should do uh, and why journalism uh, is important for democratic society. Uh, so the normal definition would be something around, you know, as a journalism, a societal or social system that provide information for free and self-governing citizens. Uh, and a lot of the time journalism is defined with the principle of journalism, again, normative, uh, like obligation to tell the truth, loyalty to citizens, uh, uh, discipline in verification, et cetera. Um, other colleagues, uh, we use a more sociological um, practice-based notion of journalism. Uh, and for example, uh, that can be defined as, uh, you know, best efforts to provide objecting accounts uh, of facts. So why is accessibility uh, important for journalism or for journalists? Um, our uh, research and interviews led to uh, two main reasons. One is that, you know, you actually broaden um, your audience. Uh, accessibility helps you reaching more people. So fulfilling, uh, put, you, put journalists in a better position to fulfill the mandate of, uh, you know, informing the citizens and making them uh, participants in democratic processes. And then there's a perhaps a less obvious uh, reason that I found it very interesting through the um, this interviews is that also um, it's not about uh, accessibility applied to journalists, but actually accessibility in the profession of journalism. Um, in a lot of countries, uh, journalists are, are seen uh, a little bit of a click. Uh, there's a very little diversity in the professions. Uh, so the biggest group would be uh, sort of male uh, white male in between 50 and 60, 65. Uh, and so uh, adding accessibility to the professional journey would also, uh, will also lead to add worldviews uh, and the way in which uh, journalists report uh, news and choose actually the news to report. Um, the second example is uh, technology, technology and media. I'm sorry, technology and media. Um, so, what is important uh, these days, nowadays, uh, in this field, subfields of media communications research, is actually uh, assessing the interplay between technological innovation, media, uh, or communications, digital communications, and social transformations. Uh, uh, two uh, very important examples of this field of study are um, the analysis of big data, uh, what government and private actors do uh, with big data and what uh, the consequences of using big data are um, to society at large. Um, or another um, example is uh, artificial intelligence. So researchers in this area try and understand um, what are the uh, potential use uh, of artificial intelligence, uh, particularly, and this is also linked very much to uh, a neighboring area, which is the policy, uh, where uh, particularly um, research and communications um, 
argue in these days mostly uh, why artificial intelligence should be regulated and what are the uh, consequences in our society. Now, uh, the link that we found most relevant between accessibility and uh, technology and media has to do with product design. Um, so a, a very important principle uh, in, uh, in technology and media communications uh, studies is the principle of design for all. Uh, and so refer, which refers to design for human diversity, social inclusion and equality. And so obviously, um, if this is a driver say for an innovation, accessibility is very much relevant uh, to uh, those that study and research uh, the design for all process. I just click. Yeah. I just, if I click, it goes on. Okay. Um, yeah. So with the connections between accessibility and these fields, you know, we we make it easy uh, for lecture to uh, integrate the topic, introduce and integrate the topic of accessibility in lectures. But we we want to go beyond this. Uh, we don't want to be limited to actually raise awareness, but we want to. Uh, inform uh, our audience, the audience of this project uh, on how and, and uh, how to facilitate uh, the inclusion of the topic of accessibility uh, as a bigger topic uh, into programs. And in this case, uh, let's say we are uh, targeting coordinators, curricular commissions, uh, or um, you know, faculty, faculty leadership uh, uh, and, and trying to shortcut the process uh, and, and getting information there and make the point that accessibility is an important topic. And we're trying to explain actually also what is important to study. And, and so, um, and we uh, use this concept of itinerary. Uh, itinerary basically are, are, are connecting the personas of the intellectual output for uh, with the training. So if you are uh, training a journalist, uh, okay, what are, through, through the fields already that are already introduced. Uh, so if you're training journalists, you know, what are the important fields uh, of media communications for that training? Uh, and you know, what is the accessibility training in our portfolio, uh, but also as topics uh, that are the most relevant to that persona. So the way in which we uh, have done this uh, is basically just by discuss discussing this uh, among our project teams and we have that kind of expertise and we have experts uh, in the area of accessibility and we have experts uh, in media communications research on the curriculum side. Okay, so it's about dialogue in, in this team uh, and eventually we come up uh, with this uh, itineraries. Uh, the itineraries of course are gonna be in the report. Uh, <laughs> uh, this graphic only shows that uh, personas connects uh, uh, fields uh, of communication or science with the accessibility modules. Uh, and now I show you uh, a little bit what this itinerary will look like uh, in the final report, but only with two. Um, this is uh, some of the universe of elements that we put together uh, in these itineraries. Uh, so we have the six personas um, the, here, the, they're still called topics, but they are fields and then the accessibility um, modules. And so this is a, a, a journalist. Uh, so a journalist, I think, uh, uh, in the previous uh, presentation was Peter. Uh, that was Peter, I'm a news editor. So we think uh, that um, to get people uh, to have the professional skills of Peter, which is, uh, in this case, obviously was a persona, but it's also a summary of real people uh, doing this job. Uh, they should have uh, an exposure to the different fields, media ethics, uh, intercultural communication, journalism, media audiences, and media literacies. Um, and so uh, we um, uh, suggest particular accessibility modules that are uh, distributed with this project. Uh, so introduction to accessibility and diversity in society, which this we recommend to all personas. And then the most best specialized in this case are uh, uh, inclusive language, uh, accessible text formatting, and accessible audiovisual content. 
uh, for social media manager. That was Tina uh, in the previous uh, uh, presentation. And the fields, uh, she's a, uh, so the fields are intercultural communication, technology, and media, media audiences, media literacy, marketing, uh, and public relations. Uh, and the accessibility modules, apart from the two basic general modules, are inclusive language, accessible design and graphs, uh, accessible text formatting, and accessible audiovisual um, content. Uh, as I mentioned, um, this is just a, a sample of what the, uh, the report contains. The report will be uh, detailed uh, on all the itineraries and all the linkages between accessibility and uh, different fields of media communications research. And it will also contain a longer list of recommendations. Uh, of course, um, they focus on the fact that uh, we follow up on the gap analysis. And so people, lecturers do not know and they should know when you know, institutions should make them aware. Uh, and so we sort of obviously pushing for um, a, a, an awareness campaign of uh, the type of information that we distribute uh, and the um, sort of the elements of our training. Uh, of course, so uh, we want awareness of training and teaching personnel about accessibility, uh, but maybe the, um, the least uh, obvious results that I want to mention here um, rather than just living in the report, is the fact that a collaboration uh, between um, what I called uh, in different universities disability offices uh, and the lecturers and the teaching personnel at large uh, is very much needed um, because we noticed uh, that even those when, uh, and in most cases that's the case, where uh, institutions have uh, experts, uh, the, the, the experts actually take over the task of making the document accessible uh, without uh, sharing that information with the lecturer. So this is why even, even if uh, some other university does do a, a much better job than if it was left to the lecturers in making the content accessible, uh, the uh, lecturer to a large extent are not aware what to do. It's just uh, the task is delegated. And so I think a strong a strong message of this program would be um, that uh, you know that delegation should uh, become rather a collaborations uh, and a sharing of information um, of of a lot of information about uh, accessibility of digital information. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And um, uh, now I need oh. to. No, everything is fine. Yes, so, yeah, we are visible on the screen. Just press stop share. No, not not yeah. new share, but stop share. Okay, yeah, let it be like this. Just to uh, say yeah. very quickly that actually we should uh, have had a break, and actually now we had to finish a break and to start with the panel discussion. But I hope it will be fine if we will have a break for ten minutes. 10 minutes? 15, at least I would say. Yeah, 10, 10 15, okay, let's have 15, a 15 minute break. And then we are back in Estonian time, it will be a quarter to six. And in Central European time, it will be a quarter to five. So, uh, and uh, to be honest, I'm very lost. I see that we have here people from Southern Asia. I don't know what kind of time you are following, but I just, uh, in 15 minutes, let's say in 15 minutes. And um, thank you so much for listening so far. And I will now uh, write that we have it at uh, 15 minutes to six, we will continue. Yeah, let's have a break. And I think that, let me now check how I could uh, stop sharing the screen here. And I, how, and I think that I need to pause recording. Yeah, let me check how, how I can do that, uh, if, if you could. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, stopped, I, stopped sharing. I stopped sharing. Oh my God, we have 15 yeah. new messages. Okay, that's a, a lot. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, how I can, uh, let me check, let me check. Uh, pause recording. It's pause, it's not stop, it's pausing. Yeah. Okay, so yes, uh, recording.
maybe if we share the screen, then we will be visible. Let's try to share the screen. Do you want me to share? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Okay, I will call a technician here. So I'm it looks sharing the screen, but I don't see. We're still not visible. Oh. And the technician is not responding. And um, what could we do? Do we have here anyone who is who could help us to understand why we don't see us anymore? Yeah, yeah we tried, but I, I can't, if I say stop video, it it should come doesn't... from this uh, camera, right? And we should see ourselves. Or maybe the camera is not on. Maybe the camera has stopped working because of timed out or something when we stopped. Mm -hmm. um, it can be fired. Yeah. Let's try. Do you have any any button on the camera? No. I can plug it out. Yeah, it's usually plug it in. Exactly. Uh, Okay, and we can try and choose. Uh, someone says try the arrow in the video button on Zoom. It should have an option of select camera. Yeah. And do we have an option? Yeah. Yes, select right. camera. Okay. I'll and select the other one. Okay, and oh, fantastic. Oh, Leticia. 100 points no, no, no. go as to Leticia. fantastic thank you so much okay um one more example my background is linguistics you know i am not an it person yes thank you so much Leticia. and um, now i am very happy to introduce uh, susanna lorin who will be moderating the discussion and panel discussion is, um, uh, do we see these people online? We should see Dr. Christopher Jenks, Professor of Intercultural Communication at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Yes, we do see you, nice, thank you. Uh, Maria Higioya, Disability Coordinator at Tallinn University in 2022-2023. Maria, do we see you? Uh, and uh, do you think that we see Maria? Yeah, I'm here. Ah, we okay, great. Yes, yes. So that's before. fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. And um, Mikael Becker, university yes. lecturer from Mid Sweden University, Department of Natural Science, Design and Sustainability. He's here. Yes. Yes, fantastic. So please, the floor is yours, and we start with panel discussion of our final Adora conference. Thank you, Anastasia. So, and welcome to my distinguished panel online. Um, it's good to see you. <laughs> and it's good, good also that somebody can see us, I think. So the idea of this panel is to discuss a little bit the situation. So not only in this project, but also in other research, um, not only us, but also others have um, found out that, that it is an issue with, um, with how we train the next generation, not only communication people, but also developers, designers, UX designers, graphical designers, content managers, front-end developers, project managers, everyone that work in, in ICT uh, in, different, in different universities, in different courses, and with different um, topics. It's, it's the same across the board uh, in the European countries that although all member states say the same thing, that they lack expertise and that there is a lack of, of professionals working in accessibility and the fact that today all public sector and bodies governed by public law need to be accessible when it comes to their websites and apps and also documents, 
Uh, and also in just two years time, uh, the next generation of accessibility legislation in the EU will also cover certain products and services. So it will be very, very broad, the requirements for accessibility. And still the vast majority of higher education institutions do not train people in accessibility. It's very odd to me that we are still in this situation, uh, but it's, it's uh, still a fact. We have some a few examples where some universities have taken it up. We have some good practices in some countries, but still uh, kind of the standard setup is that students do not learn about this. Or if it is, as Maria said, it was mentioned sometimes, uh, but it's not deep enough so that the, the students, when they come, up, come out in the, in, into employment, that they actually know enough to, uh, to do a good job as, as communication managers or developers or designers in, in uh, accessibility. So in this project, we have we have focused specifically on the on the accessibility part that is communication. Um, but you can it doesn't really matter which part you look at. It's and you can uh, kind of it's see, siloed in different ways. But but it's the same problem uh, all over. Um, so what I would like to do is to ask my panelists to introduce themselves a little bit and 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 describe what their interest in this topic is and and how is the situation in the university where where you uh, where you work so maria i will start with you and i do not dare to pronounce your last name so if you can please <laughs> say that uh hi i'm maria yuki i am um, i'm from 2016 i started as the first disability coordinator in Tallinn university and the first one in estonia full time and the aim of my job was then to build up from the ground, a uh, whole system, services, guidelines, and trainings for staff and students to offer um, students with disabilities equal access to higher education. Uh, Estonia doesn't really have legislation for it in higher education levels, so it was quite no idea what actually was the expectations. So what I did was I had to just go a lot of um, outside of the country to train and train and train to find, so it was the hardest thing, and also to find other universities to do this with. So now I run and I consult other universities in this field since uh, in Tallinn, we have gotten to a place that we do offer uh, like a systematic support. Then again, I think most, quite a lot of people even here who study in Estonia don't even know that we have this support. So I think, yeah, it's a really, really important topic to discuss. Uh, at the moment, sorry, I'm on parental leave. So if anyone wants to discuss this with their own courses, there's Kai in the counseling center who's doing my job. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for being with us, even if you're on leave officially. So it's good to see you here. And if we go to the Netherlands, so Dr. Christopher Jenkins, what's the situation like at your university there in, in Utrecht? Hi, thanks. Yeah, my, uh, my name is Christopher Jenks. I'm professor of intercultural communication and I chair the MA in intercultural communication program here. Uh, so our program uh, is uh, exclusively uh, interested in looking at uh, intersectionality issues. So we don't uh, directly look at issues of disability and accessibility, but we are interested in how such issues intersect with other issues such as nation, uh, race, and ethnicity. Uh, the bulk of the accessibility issues that are uh, discussed within our university uh, often uh, exist at the practical level. So there's a lot of uh, systems in place that uh, allow students with accessibility um, challenges to um, receive support. And this is often done very early on in the, uh, not only the application process, but in the um, sort of orientation process where uh, students are allowed to, um, or in fact, they are required to talk to a student advisor and there are um, many uh, sort of um, approaches that we can take to help uh, individual students with uh, specific issues that they may have. Um, with that said, the university doesn't have a uh, institution-wide system in place that deals with, uh, with accessibility. Um, I am originally from the U.S. and I, I taught in the U.S. and I, I feel like in the U.S. a lot of institutions have uh, system-wide or institution-wide uh, approaches to accessibility. Uh, in Europe, it, it seems like it's 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 lacking um, a bit, and perhaps this is something that we can discuss later today. But thanks for the invitation. Happy to discuss these issues further. 
Thank you very much. And then we go to Sweden. Mikael Becker, can you tell us a little bit about your program that you lead and, and the University of Mid Sweden? Yeah. Um, um, I'm running a course. Uh, we call it Universal Design of Digital Accessibility. So it's a 10 week course and it's spread over 20 weeks, one semester. So the plan is that you should be able to have, you should be able to work and study at the same time. So we have a lot of students that are coming from um, public service, also uh, private companies. Uh, we also get a lot of students from other universities, usually students that during the internship they see that they need accessibility and usability, but they can't get it at their own universities. So then they apply to, to my course. Um, it's working quite good. It's uh, 500, 500 students that apply you know, each semester, and we accept about 60. Um, we, we do it in a slightly different way, but I think that maybe it can fit um, uh, what you are going to do. <clears throat> so we don't do any coding. Uh, there are similar courses, but when you have an ICT or web developer approach. So instead we build uh, prototypes uh, and building a prototype, I can teach the students in one day or two days. And we build a functional prototype and then we test, test it on real people. And then you can hand it over to the people doing the coding. So our focus is more usability than the content and the presentation. Uh, so we have a couple of weeks with language. So to teach the student to write in a plain language, plain text. And then we force them to make a good presentation. Um, and in the end, it's an accessible PDF. Uh, and I think also in the future, we can force the students to do it in the courses that are coming after that. So today, perhaps we tell the students that <clears throat> the paper has to be in Times New Roman, 12 points, etc. But then just to add to that, that uh, you have to make an accessible PDF to pass the course. And that way we can have accessibility in all courses. So yeah, that's my take on it. Okay, thank you very much. So we have in this panel representation from kind of both sides of the project. So the, the actual content of, of accessibility, which is what we try to make sure that communication uh, institutions or communication courses have in their curriculum uh, or curricula. Uh, and also the other part, which is really when, when a student has a disability or a need that, that could potentially be supported with assistive technology or, or accommodation. So it's interesting that we have kind of both sides of this, but, but I would like to focus on, on the need for uh, kind of the, the core of this project, which is the need for knowledge on accessibility and how we can spread that and, and the knowledge and, and kind of awareness. So um, as I think it was Daria mentioned uh, earlier, we did have, we have already legislation um, in this matter in, in the EU since 2018. And still, uh, we we don't have uh, really many university courses covering this. So, Mikael, I mean, how come uh, the mid university in Sweden have this course, and and why why is, you say you get students from uh, from across the country and from other universities? So that means, which I already know, that most of the university don't provide the same kind of course. So. How come do you think the universities haven't really picked this topic up yet? I mean, why isn't it on everyone's agenda? It should be because it's a legal requirement for, for the students when they get out into the work, workforce. Mm, yeah. Um, first, I think it's uh, knowledge. What to do, how to do, uh, who to ask, where to start. Uh, so if I make a search and I end up at the... Uh, oh, on a website, so um, the, the VCAG documents, they are immense. So if that's my first approach, that's, oh no, this is too much. Um, accessibility stretches over many disciplines. So I think at least at some universities, that's a problem. Uh, so I had to search for 
I think it took three months before I found a teacher that were willing to do the language part. And of course, some are looking at us a little bit strangely. I'm from the design department. Why are you doing language? Mm. So then I have to explain that, yes, we have a teacher from the language department. She is doing this and so on. Um, I also see the motivation. So now at the university, most people, they want to apply to the law, but I believe that we should do more. I, I want to do good. And of course, the law will change over the years. So why not try to do it before the law changes? Um, some colleagues saw the, the workload to do this correctly. They, they didn't see the benefits. Mm. Um, but one thing that's been really an eye opener for us, it's uh, the students coming back from the internships. So the students are coming back from the internships and they tell us that in this company or whatever, we need accessibility. So that has, um, that changed the mind of all the teachers that were hesitant of doing this. So I, I would say to have a, some kind of advisory board for the university would be really good. So I mean, you can get this input uh, immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can, I, can I just add to that really quickly? Because, yeah, please. yeah, thanks. Because, I, you know, I'm just reflecting on my experiences working in intercultural communication uh, with issues of diversity and inclusion. And, uh, you know, apologies for, you know, referring back to the U.S. again. But, you know, my time in the U.S. Uh, showed me that, uh, that you know, what Mikhail uh, suggested in terms of some type of board at the university level, higher management university level, could actually um, help lecturers, professors know more about these issues. Um, you know, uh, in many US universities now, you have offices of diversity and inclusion that uh, actively participate in curricula discussions about what should and shouldn't be in teaching programs and individual courses. And it's not uncommon for, uh, uh, for, for lecturers to be told that you have to include this element or this aspect of society into your teaching somehow, some way. Uh, at my university at Utrecht, uh, at the moment, that, that doesn't exist. Uh, and so many people just don't know about accessibility issues. Yeah, so, so I think that's a very good idea. And maybe the Mid-University of Sweden could be one of the uh, best practices uh, that we can share, I mean, and there are more <laughs> of those, uh, but uh, but at least I think universities could potentially learn from each other because there are also different, uh, different ways of doing this. And I know when we did um, other research on trying to pick up on this, it was sometimes kind of the ICT department who did a course on university science, sometimes it's the design department and so on. So I think it's it depends very much so far on the personal interest of the lecturers or the professors who who take this up because they feel they want to do it or they have some personal interest. So, which I think is, um, uh, that's very nice because that's also building community, but but for this to scale, we need it to be much more structured, of course. And, and I really think it should be maybe the agency deciding about universities uh, at the kind of member state level should, should really do something about this. So uh, Maria, what do you think uh, coming from your perspective, um, I mean, you see the student needs and so on, but but how could we, what do you think? Why why is it still so kind of slightly backwards, <laughs> maybe in uh, in your perspective? Why why don't the universities understand the, the need for this uh, more? Well, I was a one-man team. So, I mean, I did everything. So, I mean, training, uh, counseling, uh, guidelines, uh, everything. And this was the thing uh, that even if they go into legislations or policies, like uh, our regulation, student regulation, that was the only thing that I could uh, pinpoint to because there's no governmental push for it in a sense. So lecturers would say that they're tired, they can't do it. And it's complete. Yeah, it's not in their, um, they are tired. So this is when they were said before that uh, sometimes the experts would do the materials themselves. Yes, I would do them myself because I would have a student who's anxious and they already have this anxiety that they don't belong here. So the more I'm making them wait and wait for the accessible materials, it would be easier for me to do that myself than go and teach a lecture how to do it. Mm. But why this happens, I think it's mentality because uh, 
if there's not that many people who need accessibility, then the first thing the people say is like, well, how many are there? Well, but then again, it's an oxymoron because uh, if you don't create the conditions for them to come and study or take part of it, then of course you you're not seeing any of them. So how I, we would get in Tallinn University like uh, advancements was when I would have a student in a new course, then I would know, aha, she's starting. Now I know we can take this uh, curriculum and we can start from uh, making it more accessible. Because if I would just go like, hey, come to training, no one really has time for it. A lecturer only has time for a training when literally the student is sitting in their class. It's what I learned with my years. Another thing is that uh, it's the mentality of, I think it's everywhere in Europe, at least, it's the fact that they see this one person as a disruptor that you have to cater to, uh, rather than the fact that uh, if you would make it all exclusive and accessible, which I was trying to promote, then you would have any extra things and everybody would benefit. But it takes so much time to create all of your PowerPoints and lectures and everything to make them accessible. And the university in a management level doesn't provide you the time to do this because it takes a long time to make a course and then telling them, okay, now you make a course, but you redo everything, plus learn everything to redo it too. <laughs> and it's like, okay, but who's going to pay me for it? Well, we don't really have finances for that. And then, yes, I would do it. I would do it for one student, but then I would have it. But yeah, it's kind of, um, it's management uh, issue to still which I think it comes from a governmental push because the countries that I go and I've taught uh, of what I do is they have a uh, competent governmental links. Uh, like they have people who actually know what they're doing and they then go to university and help them make these advisory boards that so you would have someone to consult to because even if you have experts in a room, you still need someone else sometimes when you, do, you don't, when you argue with yourselves. <laughs> But if you don't have that in a governmental level, then you're just, you're going to get stuck with it. And then it's easier to go, oh, well, we'll do it next time. <laughs> and the, the problem with this story, I think for me is that because we also do not train the students in accessibility, the next generation of teachers will be the same. And then we never solve the problem. And you, it doesn't matter if your team create, grows from one person to 10 people, but it still won't be enough. Uh, because we need really to make sure that the teachers have this competence and feel confident in and don't, I mean, it, yes, it takes a little bit of extra time, but if you know what you're doing, it shouldn't take so much extra time that you can't do it. I mean, it's that's that's also a bit of a way of judging the whole problem, I think. Um, yes, what we try to do is uh, we try to influence the doctorates, um, yeah. being that they're teaching uh, when they're the course of uh, teaching them teaching is already accessibility is part of it in a sense. Because it's easier to influence them than going to someone who's been in their field for 50 years doing it by a blackboard. And then when I try to say, hey, if you would do it online, it would be so much easier for me to do adjustments. And they're like, no, it's not my style. And well, I can't force you. So, <laughs> so yeah, you, you do start with the youngest to kind of implement them. Because when it's the norm, then it's the norm. When it's something I have to redo everything, then it's a completely different thing. I think I hate new things too. So it's the same mentality. It just takes a lot of time and frustration to learn it. Yeah. So I, I know we um, collaborated for a couple of years ago with um, uh, a British university where they had students who learned um, captioning and things like that. And they started to volunteer as student, they volunteered as kind of support to, to other students with disabilities. So they got this into, uh, to be more of a community thing. And of course, all of them were not experts, but I think that's also a, a good way of kind of engaging uh, other students to, to teach them, and then they can help each other in a good way. Of course, it, this doesn't take of the steam of the tra trainers, they, the teachers still need to know what they're doing and, and we do need experts. But I also think that that sometimes um, every step of the way doesn't have to be a super expert that is certified in accessibility. We can also just be humans and, and kind of support each other. I think that is that could also help um, quite a long way when it's not too technical. I mean, taking notes or, or supporting people is also possible to do. Um, among among the students, uh, if you provide that in a in a good way. So I wanted to ask uh, Christopher, what do you think can be done to to bridge this? How do we how do we move forward? What's the kind of what's the solution here? Now we've talked about the problems. So how can we? Do you have any ideas except for having a board, which I think is a very good idea? But what do you see as the potential step to to make this work better in Europe? Sure. I mean, I, I think there there are a 
you can look at it from a teaching perspective or you can look at it from a, a research perspective. I think just very quickly from a research perspective, I think what needs to happen is uh, researchers need to be encouraged to uh, engage in scholarship that is more impactful and inclusive and sustainable. And so looking at research, not in a linear way where we're publishing and speaking to uh, other academics, uh, you know, within journals uh, that often are only read by academics, but we should be collaborating with uh, with organizations and companies and institutions that actively care about uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, and from a teaching perspective, I can give you one example from our university within the, the program that I uh, uh, that that I manage. Um, we have uh, we actively seek partnerships with uh, large organizations for our students to do internships, and one of those uh, partners uh, is IKEA, and they're uh, interested in promoting in better understanding uh, cognitive uh, diversity within the workforce, and so they want to know what they're doing well and what they're not doing well, and they. Um, uh, in effect, hire our students as interns to study such issues. And so I think, you know, teaching needs to be like research, more impactful and collaborative. And we need to establish these partnerships um, to to seek change. Uh, because, uh, you know, again, often I think the, the sort of the default position for most researchers, at least within intercultural communication, is to uh, work within these closed boundaries or doors, and and we need to open up our research and and, and think about how we can make our, our scholarship more impactful within societies. I think that's a really good idea, and I've I've always thought uh, that the demand side is extremely important. So that to in order to make universities teach accessibility, that there needs to be a demand. So we need to I think if you have the companies around you where kind of the cool IT places wherever all the students want to want to work, then maybe IKEA is one of those. But I mean, some of the uh, really large organizations around the businesses where people want to work, if they would say, hey, we really need that competence um, to, to in order to to hire your students, then that would make the change, I think, easier than just coming to the university management and say, you should do this because of blah, blah, blah. I think the demand would be a much uh, demand side from the from potential employers would be much more impactful or powerful. Kind of yeah, money, I mean, money yeah. you know, I, I, I agree. I mean, and then that that's I mean, students understand, you know, uh, the sort of the, the value that these companies provide. And so they, they, they'll gravitate towards these issues naturally, I think. I, yeah, I, I agree. Hmm. Okay, Mikael, what do you think? I mean, you have already made a change uh, in your university, but but if you if you were to uh, spread the word or or make a bigger change, try to reach out to other of your university colleagues in other in other universities in higher education. So how how could we as society or or any stakeholder kind of support this and 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 make sure that it's uh, being scaled up and trickled out to to all different uh, educational institutions? Hmm. Well, uh, I'm from the design subject. Um, so co-creation has worked really, really nice for us to invite real people and also people that have higher demands. So for example, we have uh, some courses in packaging design. So how to do a good package? I should be able, it should protect what's inside and should protect from the outside, I should be able to open it, close it again. Uh, so we invite people with uh, rheumatism. So you don't have the coordination in the fingers, you don't have the muscles and so on. Because if I, if the students are testing on each other, they can compensate. They, they have the strength, they have the coordination. And I think that is something that you can do in many other cases as well. So I, I had invited uh, a blind person to come. So he, he was supposed to talk about assistive technology and how he is using smartphones and apps and so on. So uh, I invited people from the university, come and see, listen. And they were appalled, I think, because I asked him to do two kind of simple tasks on the MEON on a, the university website. And he couldn't do it. 
and the audience thought that we have a good website, but they had followed them. Um, the checklists and they had done simulations but they had never invited a real person who was blind to actually test the website so when we do this it's an eye opening for the students and the students will spread the word uh, and it's also an eye opening for for the colleagues at the university so try to find real people invite them uh, if it's research or if it's education uh, it works in both ways. And of course, if, if we get more people, students with disabilities, that will also kind of work from the inside, that then, then the, the other students will learn from the, their um, colleague students with, uh, with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So that the more diversity we have inside of the groups, the, the better it is, of course. So, so that's, um, that's a very good uh, a very good point and reminds me of another project that we are <laughs> having together with also with Maja here um, called uh, Intax, where we are uh, actually trying to make sure that that um, students, UX students, UX design students do user testing with people with disabilities, because that's also another kind of gap <laughs> uh, in the in the curricula. So um, I wanted to finish off with uh, talking about the, the material that we have provided. And I know that you have just been presented to the project right, right now, so you don't know everything uh, about it, obviously, or the details. But, but do you think, just hypothetically, that the mater that's material like the ones that we have created in a door, kind of a free for everyone to use material on communication uh, uh, accessibility, do you think this could be useful either in, in your institutions or, or be spread somewhere or how could we how could we make sure that we kind of leverage the, the work that has been done and if you have any ideas of, of kind of scaling up or 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 how, how it can be used or useful or if you don't think that is useful then what would be needed in instead or or in um, to complement that Maria do you want to start I think you're muted I agree with uh, what was said before is the fact that how we realize that this, what works is the fact that you need someone, an expert of your field, yes, but then you need a real user. So it's a it's a triangle, me at the lecture and then a student. And that's how we worked out accessibility of our course in a sense. All three components are needed. Because otherwise, it's just we don't know it. Because there's so many things that are made with just an expert thinking. And then actually, yeah, a real user will come and they just like, this is nonsense. So this is why for years I've been doing these uh, um, life courses that are in Tallinn, they're project management, which I take uh, like a problem in society uh, that we have. And in Estonia, there's quite a lot of them in the disability field. And then it's a semester that the students have to uh, give me a real life solution for it. So they have, uh, so we, we use science space, so they have to find the research and everything. And by the end of it, it's not a theoretical place. It literally has to be something that's working and you can access it now. So like last year, students uh, wanted to tackle bullying disabled students in schools. And then they realized that none of uh, in Estonian curriculum, they teach about disabilities in the schools. So the students created uh, uh, one, no, yeah, one hour, <laughs> let's say, uh, info where they uh, interacted the students and now they're, it's in other schools too, and they're starting to implement it. Um, and it was a thing that no one even noticed that it was missing. They were just talking, oh, they're bullying, you know, they don't know about them, but no one actually had the time to think of a solution. But with how these kind of things are implemented, what also works is the fact that you still need a management to actually uh, give you an okay with it. If it's just uh, like me, a practitioner who's gonna say, hey, let's do this, this is an amazing material. It doesn't really work. You need someone to actually hire status to, yeah, like make a board or sit down, make a, to, to have time to implement it and for it to be all over. It's not just one department or one lecturer who does it, it has to be every everybody does it, then it works. It doesn't work if just one person does it and then the students are like, okay, when we pick uh, subjects and they're like, okay, I can take his subject and I can't take his. And we're like, yeah, but you have to take both of them because otherwise you're not going to finish your degree. It's because it's just, you're accepting a student to come study, but you're actually not giving them opportunity to study. 
Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So we are kind of moving up uh, up the ladder and then trying to make a societal change uh, at the universities to to make this change. But with, it was, um, I think it was a good expression with the kind of the three pillars that ne is needed to to make this work out in in real life. So thank you for that. And uh, Christopher, what do you think? Any Anything free material can do, course material, do you think anyone, is there a chance anyone would take it up or do we need to change the whole system and put it into the curriculum first? No, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, thinking about the Odor project and the materials, I think, uh, you know, a key uh, indicator of success would be the issue of adaptability. And I think that it, it's it's there in the, in, in the project. And I, th I think, you know, um, it is, uh, a challenge to uh, incorporate uh, something as big and important as accessibility into a curriculum. But I think if there is um, uh, a degree of adaptability of the materials, then it, it would be you know easier to sort of squeeze in. So I'm thinking about intercultural communication, for example. Uh, you know, uh, if you take an intersectional perspective, then you can easily talk about accessibility in relation to uh, race and ethnicity, uh, nation and nationalities. And that way, people can understand that when when we we talk about diversity and inclusion, we're not just thinking about race and ethnicity uh, and language, but we're also uh, thinking about you know able-bodied people, disabilities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, adaptability is is key to it, and I think it's there. Um, and it's just a matter of spreading the word and disseminating the information. Uh, uh, I myself will think more about it in in the future years as a result of this discussion, certainly. So that's good. We already made a little bit of an impact. <laughs> One person that's scaling up. So no, but it, it also reminds me what you say about um, in a workshop last year and last week in, in Brussels, where people uh, came from very different disciplines and we didn't really find the right language or the right terminology rather. So accessibility has a very kind of specific, as many topics have a very specific terminology. And sometimes people don't, just don't um, we call it design for all or universal design or inclusiveness or and 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 sometimes really accessibility and usability kind of crossover as well so so I think that is that is also one of the issues that you need to to speak to to this specific group in maybe using other terms or des describing it in another way so I think that is that's also one of the fights we need to fight to to kind of spread the word but uh, but it's good that's positive we at least we we managed to get one one person on board <laughs> that's thank you for that and uh, and Mikael I, I was uh, I was thinking about you said that you allow 60 students every semester I think or every year um, so what do you know anything about what they do when they uh, graduate do you know where they end up or what kind of roles they have now do you have any any clue do you know uh, I think most of them will end up either with media and communication, they will become working with information or communication, uh, either private companies or in the public sector. Um, some, but they are, well, let's say 10, 20% percent, <clears throat> perhaps, uh, end up with the ICT, uh, web development or uh, uh, developing apps. Hmm. Okay, so but that that means that potentially a kind of a, a big spread who have at least had your ten weeks uh, and and kind of a, like a baseline and and could maybe go out in the world and and spread the word. So, do you think that the kind of material that the Adore project is providing or any other kind of free material out there could could be a, a support and help spread the word, spread awareness, and make sure people know more about this? Or do we need to do something else? I think the problem will be to <clears throat> to find out our project mm. because he, um, I had hadn't heard of it until you contacted me, mm. so it, it will not be the first choice if I'm searching for it. Mm. But uh, <clears throat> I think it would be brilliant if uh, the toolkit could be included in the regular books that we have at the university. So <clears throat> you see the bookshelf behind me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have books on typography, design, product design, many subjects, but none of them include accessibility or usability. So the books on accessibility and usability are on a separate shelf, but they should be in the same book, yeah. um, same chapters. 
So I think it's a problem if we continue to treat accessibility and usability as a special thing that you do on the side. It has to be included. Yeah. That's very that's very good. Thank you. Very good closing words, I think, for this uh, panel as well, because that is really that is inclusion for real, also to include the topic. And I, I really think you're right. And uh, we said many years ago that we should stop having these kind of events where we only talk about accessibility, because what we really we keep preaching to the choir and we should get out in the real world and talk to to other people. So thank you very much, um, dear panelists, for this discussion. And I, I hope that you have um, that the the audience also got some new ideas. We certainly did. And I, I've heard Anastasia typing all the time. So I think we have a, a good good input also to, to the project. And now we would like to open the floor for questions, I think. Yes. Yes. And uh, now we have time for questions and answer session. And uh, I was checking chat and uh, so far I haven't seen questions there. I just saw people's reaction to talks and also comments. And also I would pay attention to this fact that some people suggested ideas for possible projects and professional collaboration, but questions. And um, we are eager to hear questions from audience here in this classroom and also from Zoom participants. I understand that that's the end of the working day and we had so many presentations in a row and we had a panel discussion which was very engaging. Oh, I see a hand. If you could please unmute yourself. Birgitta from EBU. Please unmute yourself, you are muted. They should be able to. Yeah. Yes, please. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for this meeting. I am blind, so it took me some time to find a, a mute button. That's why I, it took me a little while. Uh, so thanks again for this interesting presentation and also for the project. I represent EBU, which is the European Blind Union, and we represent over 30 million people with some sort of visual disability in over 40 countries in Europe. And we have been involved in several EU projects as well. And um, we promote the interests and the rights of, in our case, specifically blind and partially sighted people. And um, our promotional activities are also coming to the conclusion that we have to start at the beginning and that's with education. So we really welcome this project that you have done or that you're still doing. And we hope that there will be a follow-up because it's extremely important to start here. And I can only applaud also what Anna said about the three pillars, uh, and that's involving us. Uh, the slogan of the European Disability Forum, which is of course broader than just blind and partially sighted people, is nothing about us without us. So we as experts from daily life of what it means to live with a disability and to have accessibility problems and inclusion, lack of inclusion, um, can actually do that practical check, if you will, on materials or on other activities. So I have two questions and maybe one remark or proposal. And talking about accessibility, diversity, inclusion, I wondered, um, happy to see Anna on the panel as disability, um, uh, uh, what, how do you call it, a person at university. I know that in the Netherlands, I'm originally from the Netherlands, some universities have a disability, um, oh, I can't remember the name now, accessibility help, helping coordinator, person. Coordinator, yeah. at least. Yes, thank you. Um, so have more disability coordination people who are the experts from practice, have they been involved in this project in this Adora project and also with the production of materials and at what stage and in what way. And the second question is, how have people with disabilities in this case been involved at what stage and in what way? And with your last question uh, to the panel on how this material could be used, um, 
depending on the answers to my previously previous two questions, would be start with having them checked with people who have disabilities or with the disability um, people from universities who can check if they are actually accessible. I had a quick look at the material. Uh, and for example, the images do not have alt text. So I don't know what's on the images. So that would be one, one thing to have them checked and make sure that everything is accessible before really spreading it and making use of the disability organizations who can help spread this if they think it's a, it's a good addition. Thank you very much and hope that this will have a follow up because it's a great project. Thanks. Thank you, Brigitte. I'll start with the, with the last one. So uh, we are responsible for the accessibility of the material. And uh, that doesn't sound good that you have found images without alternative text, because that should that has been checked thoroughly by our experts. And of course, we always work with people with disabilities. I have a disability myself, and that is how we do everything we do. So ab absolutely, people with disabilities have been uh, deeply involved in at least the um, uh, we have been mostly from Funka, we have been mostly working on IO3 and we do not do anything without checking with people with disabilities and we also have disabled persons in in our uh, in our staff but but um, I'm I really hoped that that everything that was published was uh, was already uh, accessible because that is what it should be so I'll make sure we recheck that again. But for the other uh, for the other parts, I will defer to my colleagues who have been working more with the research on uh, on the university side, on how much you have um, collaborated with with disability coordinators and such. I think we have done mostly surveys, but maybe. Oh um, yeah, can you hear me? I think you need to come yeah, here to please come here. yeah to yeah. be closer to the microphone. I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thank you for this question. This is actually something we just discussed previously as uh, ideas for our following activities. Uh, what we did uh, was check the state as is, like we did a desk research, desktop research, plus uh, we did interviews with professors. And you are suspecting, right, we did not include people with disabilities. You know, we were just uh, in the, that second phase. Uh, we wanted to know uh, what's the general knowledge of digital accessibility in academia, basically. Um, so in that phase, uh, no um, people with disabilities were used. But this is definitely something that we plan to do in the future, in the next following steps of Pro ideally of the next project that's going to be like follow up on this one. Here we learned what is and next steps are going to be addressing what could be and definitely uh, people with disabilities will have to be included. Yeah. Yes, but um, if okay. uh, now I think that we have to switch yes. to switch the places. Yeah, but if to talk about uh, the first uh, phase and uh, the specific, where is the specific objective was to analyze the current situation, what kind of real needs uh, among uh, teaching staff and training staff are, then actually we also included uh, end users in our survey and end users were represented by people with disabilities, all the adults migrants, minority groups, refugees. So these people participated in survey and they uh, had this chance to communicate what kind of issues uh, uh, they have when they actually have to use digital content. So that was also documented in Intellectual Output 1 report, which is named uh, Gap Analysis on Accessibility Training Needs. And um, Think? No, uh, maybe you need you have to come here. Uh, yeah, I think to a certain extent we did where it was necessary because uh, in that particular instance uh, we are uh, we talking about the content, so the quality of the content there we need uh, an input uh, and the gap analysis. 
Um, but then there's all these other parts um, that have to do with the curriculum. And so we actually asked um, the people that are involved in the curriculum, whether they see the topic being included. So, um, you know, as far as um, if the content of the training, then it came from Funka. Uh, and as I understand, you know, this is, uh, they have a, um, a way of actually choosing the content and shaping the content. And that it is uh, one collaboration uh, with all kinds of experts. Yes, but the, so the, the most important the ability part, coordinators, we know yeah. that was never really the, the, I mean, that's an interesting question, yeah. but but we, I don't think that was thought about as a target audience for any of the, yeah. um, so mm. but maybe we should have <laughs> talked yeah, to the coordinators. Yeah. Yeah. But that's also very good food for thought and for, next, for continuation for project, of the project, yeah. project yeah. to work with disability coordinators. And um, I hope that we reply to this question because I see that we have a very long question that came on chat and it says that uh, could we recommend any good technical course literature about digital accessibility for software engineers uh, and colleagues at the technical faculty at Lund University in Sweden will have a new course in digital accessibility and this will be program information and communication engineering uh, program next year. Okay, and we already have some recommendations coming. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much, Mikhail, and thank you for your re recommended literature. That's nice. Audience asks questions and replies to these questions. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I don't know if it uh, if it fits the description of of course literature, but but I would also like to to promote, of course, IWP's uh, body of knowledge of uh, that is supposed to lead to to professional certification. But you can read the body of knowledge material, which has a lot of links to different source material and so on. And I mean, you don't need to go all the way to certification, but you can use that also as a that's also a compilation of, of different sources and, and quite good material, I think, to, to for self-studies at least. And of course, there are a lot of both commercial and some free uh, courses online also on more the technical parts of, of uh, accessibility. And I see some reading recommendation in Swedish. And... Um... We still have time for how many questions? Oh. Yeah, and, and Mikael is actually uh, pointing to a good source also in Swedish, but that reminds me of that many of the member states who have uh, monitoring agencies to go with, the, I mean, all member states have monitoring agencies for the Web Accessibility Directive, but quite a few of them do have good information. It's usually in the local language. Um, but but really a kind of how to meet the, the recommendations um, that are officially provided because the monitoring agencies are not only obliged to monitor how the enforcement or the implement, implementation of the directive is, is, is happening in public sector bodies. They're also obliged to, to facilitate training and awareness, I think is that what, what the law says. And uh, quite a few of the member states do provide good material. Some are very kind of strict and very technical, but some are uh, much more easy, easy to read and, and kind of open and, and um, uh, like helpful, more support, supportive material than others. I know the Finnish are very good Norwegians as well. And, and also in Denmark, there are quite a few uh, material. The Dutch, I think, is also there. So in the Netherlands, they have quite a lot of Good information as well so that could be one one way of, of finding material maybe uh, to look at the european commission the monitoring agencies of uh, in the european member states connected to the web accessibility directive there's a list of all the uh, of all the monitoring bodies and when you go to their um, sites and um, if you pick the ones where you know understand the language and uh, then that may also be a good source for kind of free of charge and, and quite official um, information And um, thank you. And uh, yes, it seems like the, the presentation of the project was absolutely perfect because 
<laughs> no one has. I believe that it's the end of the working day, and uh, that's why people are already so tired. And maybe it's also a part of our working culture. Monday evening <laughs> here in Estonia. But I think we could also wrap up by by saying something about what we have talked about in the in the consortium, our potential uh, next steps. So we haven't decided anything, but I mean, we talked about being more practical, hands-on, trying to provide maybe a course, uh, digital course, something like that, and also potentially trying to show, uh, make students get some kind of diploma or certificate so that it would mean something to them to to run this, these courses that have, is one of the things that we have been uh, talking about. And then also collecting best practices was also something we we talked about doing. And now here comes new new content. <laughs> yeah, new blood. Um, no, I wanted to um, uh, react to the panel discussion a little bit. I find it very interesting, by the way. Uh, thank you very much to the three speakers. Um, but I, I, I would like to add a little bit of a positive message. Uh, so I... I, I I was brought in as a curriculum expert in communications, no, not an accessibility um, accessibility expert uh, as such. Um, and I have to say that nonetheless, universities in Europe uh, react to social changes and, uh, or market demand, so to speak. Uh, um, and I've been involved in curriculum design in different with different countries. So I know the system, for example, in the Netherlands and in Denmark, in Belgium, in Austria, uh, in Ireland as well. Um, and that goes from slow to very slow. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in a way, um, it, it was good, uh, you know, the, the uh, thinking about the states where in that respect, uh, they, have, uh, they are a little bit more advanced, but in the states they are, much more reactive to markets and uh, they have to shape up with like we we can lose students you know students think this is updated and we still get the same money from from the state you know it, it takes years for uh for actually a top-down uh somehow decision and say okay we need you need to change something and eventually that happens in between um but so i i think it will it will be an issue uh, it will change it will have Accessibility have a, will have a, a bigger place uh, uh, into communications curriculum in the near future. Um, and I'm thinking, uh, um, because also this is a, a, an issue at a European level uh, uh, for the European Commission. Uh, and so, so we play a part and say, oh, okay, we, uh, um, we, we, we sort of already bring the material and, and, and make things available and start awareness and start you know, make it easier for lecturers to integrate the topic. But the actual accelerator factor is, is how much this is important for society, how much this is important for the European Union, et cetera. And I, and I can uh, give two short examples. Uh, one, for example, is social innovation. Uh, I, know, I know that a lot of management courses now, they prepare managers for uh, managing nonprofit organizations something that wasn't the case like 10 years ago. Um, and I'm thinking, for example, of, of uh, uh, sustainability, the topic of sustainability uh, uh, that um, somehow now is gonna be a requirement soon uh, for a lot of companies who have su uh, sustainability reports uh, and university has, are really um, uh, you know, running and, and creating these courses on sustainability experts. Uh, so before uh, the sustainability people were PR, uh, people with no technical knowledge about sustainability, and now they have to be PR plus uh, knowledgeable of the topic of sustainability. So I, I see a, um, a better future uh, where, uh, and you know, uh, and, and the people like you and Funka and uh, you know that um, somehow lobbying uh, for the issues, you know, and making more of a topic, uh, and then uh, and then you know, uh, universities slowly. Uh, will catch up and, and you know, uh, finally decide and, and go through the different steps of creating a curriculum, which is quite complicated. Um, but when, when it becomes really important and there is a demand, there are students uh, who want to study this because they're going to find jobs, uh, then, then, you know, it will happen. 
it's, it's just absurd that that <laughs> needs to be I, I agree with you and i hope that you're right but but i think it's still absurd that we need to at this we sit here in 2023 and hope for the future because <laughs> i think i mean everyone knows that that we have i mean it's part of being human that we have yeah. different abilities and it shouldn't be something that you need to wait for it should have been there long ago so that's it should be but i think you know it, it, it will be when these jobs become more popular when mm. these jobs become larger in numbers yeah. uh, mm. you know now uh, as i said the co corporate uh, corporate social responsibility experts you know are needed pretty much in every mid to big yeah. um, big uh, size firm uh, and so this is why now uh, universities are really preparing and start a lot of young people. Mm -hmm. As it happened with, you know, social media managers, social media managers now, uh, they're all, you know, 27 to 30. And, and mm -hmm. obviously 20 years ago, there was no need of social media managers. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, and this was a, a you know, a huge demand, uh, uh, changing very rapidly, growing very rapidly, and so every university yes, but, did this very but for quickly. Me, but but <laughs> so, but disability is not a trend. That's my point. I mean, it was a trend. The, no, yeah, yeah. So, yeah that, I, mean, that, I mean, it's kind of it should be. It should be. But, but so evident. Could, yeah, thing. yeah. So it no. depends. It depends also how uh, how many companies and how many institutions actually have want to have dedicated people mm. into this. And as I said, this I'm not an expert, so I don't know now. What is the status of that uh, evolution? Well, it is uh, definitely changing, it is but definitely but, changing, but yeah. so I I mean if I look twenty years back, a lot of ha has happened. So I, I agree with you; it's moving in the right direction. I just don't understand why it takes so long and why people uh, need why we need to have kind of legislation and money in the system to make yeah. people realize that if you are if you want to communicate with people, you want to communicate with everyone. You don't want to exclude sure. them. That should be yeah. self-evident. And that's that's kind it of is. what I'm struggling with understanding. Why are we having this conversation? Yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of the yeah. I but because good. even even at the, even when is it self-evident or when there's a clear need, you know, the the actual system mechanism <laughs> is slow. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you yeah. have to mm -hmm. you have to have a you know certain in some countries, you have to it has to come from the government somehow right. and approval. In some others, uh, you know, you need. It. And then, and uh, one of the speakers, I, I showed how, how many. This is a comp more complicated, uh, if you want, um, situations. More complicated subject to teach than yeah. than because uh, different uh, subjects, etc. So yeah. I think it has to do with the with the system being slow and the subject to be and subject being quite complicated. Mm. Okay, we do we have um, yes, and Birgitta is, is pointing to the UN Convention of Human Rights for People with Disabilities. So that is that should be the I mean all the member states and the EU has signed, so it should be should be self evident. So that's why I'm that's what sure, I'm saying. Sure, sure. Let's hope for for change uh, happening uh, at least even if it's slow. Let's hope that it keeps happening. So Anastasia, did you have any closing words or uh, do you think that you should already proceed to the closing. Um, well, we don't have any more questions. We are kind of regurgitating okay, so, our so own we questions. Have time flies. And um, well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank. Sorry. Move to the camera. Move to the camera. Uh, move to the... <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yes, we, we had to change uh, uh, the places. So first of all, I would like to thank everyone who is now on Zoom platform and sharing with us this uh, wonderful event on accessible communication. And of course, everyone who came and uh, participated in person as a listener. And uh, thank you so much for your active engagement. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for sharing your ideas. And uh, definitely I want to thank the wonderful Adore team uh, with whom I collaborated when we worked on uh, this project uh, of digital accessibility in higher education curricula. And um, as a project leader, I have to say that, that we had every month a meeting and I was amazed that every month we had this meeting with everyone uh, in our team because uh, it just showed how responsible people are and how seriously they take the topic. Um, and um, to be uh, completely honest, uh, this topic of uh, accessible communication became really close to my uh, heart when uh, the project started. And in some months I 
managed to break my leg and um, I became partially disabled person because I was not able just to live my ordinary life, what I'm used to have. And for example, I had to, to use a lot of uh, content also online. And then I discovered a lot of things when, for example, you need to order food or to order some kind of services and you do it online and how you do it. And I discovered that actually people with disabilities, uh, they have uh, a lot of challenges in their life. And uh, uh, now, uh, I can walk again and uh, I don't need many of those services that uh, I used to need when I had this problem with my leg. And uh, sometimes uh, it's like um, when we were working, we were working on this project and um, I'm just thinking about how important the results are. It's like this someone internally inside me always reminds me that we have to think about people who are end users and who need uh, really accessible communication. So when we do something, we have to think about our audience. And uh, that's why I would say that I'm really happy to see uh, this um, highly engaged experts participated in our final conference. And thank you so much to our panelists, Professor Christopher Jenks from Utrecht University. Thank you very much, Maria Higioya. And uh, I have already written in chat that you are a star who did a lot on uh, as a disability coordinator at Tallinn University in 2022-2023. And I participated in some of your trainings and uh, hopefully became a little bit smarter as well. And um, thank you, Mikhail Becker uh, from um, Mid Sweden University, thank you so much for your very instructive uh, discussion and thank you also for literature recommendation. And thank you everyone for your questions, for, your, for sharing your ideas, for sharing your thoughts. And uh, a nice uh, conclusion would be that um, I would say, let's everyone try to be an accessible communicator. So when we produce the content, let's try to reach everyone and let's try to be really inclusive. And um, thank you very much. Oh, I see reaction that this conference has definitely broadened uh, my view on the topic. Thank you very much, Anano. And I think that that's a very, very good dot to this conference. I believe that everyone has broadened his horizon today about the topic and accessibility in digital communication. And we all deserve applause, I believe. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> and um, now I think we need to stop recording. Yes. <laughs> Is this the end? Should we say goodbye to the yes, people? Yes, uh, yeah. yes, uh, because so, we have what we actually have. We don't share the screen, right? No, we just uh, okay. Yeah, we, no, we just we are just yes. Oh, oh, okay. We still have some reaction coming yes. here. No, we want to have this positive feedback. We will not <laughs> stop recording. <laughs> Thank you for the excellent webinar. It has been brilliant to hear about the work completed in this project. Thank you so much for this wonderful feedback. Thank you and. Uh, the audience here, I hope that any feedback? <laughs> well, we basically can uh, agree with Donamo that like it, like he, we are like super happy that this uh, problem was raised and like I generally feel like I'm going to walk out the door and I'm gonna do something about it to like make a small change do something about it. Now we all want to be the change we want to see in this world, right? In accessible yes. communication. And uh, thank you. Then let's thank online participants. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And uh, now we will end the webinar. So.